Hey, hello. Hello, Colleen, Chris Anderson in, uh, you know, are you in London? I am in London. I, I, I arrived oh, about half an hour ago. From? Vienna. Ah, willkommen. Oh, yeah, willkommen. It was very willkommen good. History Happy Hour. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and yeah. you are you are in Chicago. I, see I am from, in the great state of Illinois in Chicago. Many awards on the wall that look familiar. Yeah. Somehow it all seems kind of the same, right? <laughs> Welcome everybody to History Happy Hour, uh, and a special thanks to Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours for helping to bring you this show. Check out their rich offering of history tours in Europe, America, and the Pacific, which is about a month away, uh, at stephenambrosetours.com. Uh, and Chris, I don't know if people are watching live or watching on replay or listening on the HHH podcast. Uh, yeah. There's not some other sporting event going on this Sunday. No, there's no Super Bowl this oh, okay, week. Uh, but however you find your history happy hour, we're glad that you're here. Today we're going to be talking about a combat nurse with Patton's Third Army and a new book out about her. So let us know you're out there, what you're drinking, if you are drinking. Chris, Chris, who is, do we have anybody, is there anybody watching? Yeah, there's in fact people watching. Uh, Carla is calling from Oklahoma, uh, watching, not calling, sorry. Uh, and uh, Francine Miller from uh, around New York City. Uh, George Luz is with us. So oh, George, it. hello. Uh, I see Kennedy. Lynn Hargrove. Yeah. Lizzie Borden, who's complaining about my glasses, so I hear. She's just looking out for it. She's just, just looking word out coming for in on the sly there. Okay. Concerned viewer. <laughs> I've now made my rep with Lizzie there. I've helped us both. Uh, Jim Stark, Ken Reddick, Susan Yu, all sorts of people uh, uh, here uh, ready to go for History Happy Hour. I just want to thank everybody who supports us, Chris, via uh, Patreon. And yes. I want you to notice uh, in the top shelf um, patrons, there's a few more names. Wow, well, look okay. at that. So Wally Morrison is there, and um, there's another. Oh my gosh, I cannot think of the other name of the person who we just added to this list. But you know, once again, we are starting to approach the bottom. I, I haven't actually are made we, the type smaller yet. I just we're gonna have to get more hats soon. Um, oh right, I should. I have to offer those people hats. Yeah. My goodness, um, I will take care of that. Thank you for the reminder. Um, it's you know, hard to keep everything in mind. Um, so, so uh, I, I, have we killed enough time yet? Are we, I think we. I, I mean, think we. Yeah, we 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 do this every week, but you know, there comes a moment where we just have to get on with the show, like it or not. And I think our guests probably really appreciate that. I I'm sure our guests appreciate yeah. it. Give me a cue, and I'll get going. <laughs> The bar is open. The bar is open. And Chris, uh, so we have a very interesting show today. We're going to be talking with the author of a book called For the Boys, uh, the war story of a combat nurse in Patton's Third Army. And the subject of the book and pictured on the cover is a nurse named Mary Balster. Uh, and the author of the book is her daughter, NCR Davis, who lives in Georgia. And when she is not writing about her mother, writes about the impact of technology on culture, currency, and politics in the Western world. And so we want to say, hey, welcome to Nancy Davis. How are you doing? Great. How are you? Uh, we're well, I'm fine. I think Chris is fine. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll just jump in and get right started. Um, uh, Nancy, your mother was a combat nurse in World War II, and she worked for the 39th Evacuation Hospital, which, you know, once it arrived in Europe, followed Patton's Third Army to the end of the war. And your book kind of covers her story from um, uh, Pearl Harbor Day, December 7th, 1941. Right until her marriage uh, in February 1946. So what inspired you to write this book? What's the story behind this book? Growing up, um, there was family lore surrounding uh, my parents in the war, but particularly my mother. But there was just about her gaffes, nothing serious. Um, I could see from every time we moved, there was this big red volume, and I'll get it for you here, of letters uh, that were, you know, in some 
upstairs closet somewhere for all the years of uh, my formative life. And then when my mother turned 90, she was a nurse, so, and she had been a director of um, nursing homes, so she knew a lot about geriatric medicine and realized that she was losing her short-term memory. And on her 90th birthday, she happened to be living um, outside of Richmond, Virginia with uh, one of my sisters. And my dad had been dead for a couple of years. And she asked me after a very nice celebration of her 90th to uh, come upstairs with her and help her get settled in for a nap. After a little bit too much champagne, she loved champagne. <laughs> and uh, so I helped her get up the stairs and as uh, she was getting settled to take a little nap in her recliner in her room, she pointed to that red volume of letters and said, do you remember those? Yep. I mean, I've never read them, I said, but I know about the war letters. And she said, well, it's the time you read them and I'm giving them to you on my birthday today. And then she walked over to her dresser and in the top drawer of her dresser, she pulled out a book I'd never seen, and it was her service diary from the war. In the meantime, I had gone over to the nightstand where the big red volume of letters were, and I, you know, just thumbed through and looked at the last entry, which was October 31st, 1945. But when she handed me that service diary, of which you can see the tip of it, on the cover of the book, uh, it says my life in the service. When she handed me that little, little service diary, I flipped through it and I saw the last entry was May 6th, 1945, the E-Day. And so first question I had was, mother, that's five months that are not in the service diary that are have letters that are chronicled those time that those months. What's what's going on with that? And then I noticed that she'd torn out that last section of the service diary. And she gave me some sort of evasive answer, like, you know, oh, you know, when you're young, you do silly things, that sort of thing. So uh, I thought, well, I'm gonna have to get to the bottom of that. But in the meantime, I asked her, what do you want me to do with these archives? And she said, I also have photographs, but I've got to find them and I'm going to send them to you later. What do you want me to do with the mother? Well, I want you to edit them. Well, I, I mean, you're both writers. You understand? I, I didn't know what that meant. You know, I mean, <laughs> how do you edit people's letters? It doesn't make a lot of sense. I didn't really understand what she wanted. And, um, and she said the reason that she chose me out of the six children was because I have a writing background. I used to teach college writing. So she figured, you know, I would be the one to do it. And he said, well, I just want some sort of legacy for the family. You know, that that's all. And I want the people that I mentioned in those letters and in that diary to be celebrated and remembered because we're all dying now. And I said, okay. So I took them home. I lived in San Antonio at the time. And when I got home, I started reading them. And I just couldn't get to what was really going on. It just, later on, my agent, Peter Riva said, well, I know what was going on. She sugarcoated those letters because you got to remember the audience. And of course, as writers, we know, we, yeah. we think a lot about our audience, right? Well, she was keen. She had a keen sense of audience as a young woman and thought, I'm writing these letters to my parents. I'm not going to, <laughs> you know, I've got to sugarcoat them. And so all those letters really did for me was as a, you know, just piqued my curiosity to think what, what's behind the letters? What's the story behind the letters? So a couple of months went by and I called, called her at my sister's in Richmond. And I asked my sister to put her on the phone. And when she did, I said, mother, I'm going to just start off by saying I read through the letters. I've read the diary, got more out of the diary than I did the letters. But I want you to just tell me if you had to describe 
the war part. Normandy and on to post-war Germany. If you had one word to describe your experience, what would that word be? And granted, as you know, at about 65 years post the time, the experience that I'm asking her about. And it didn't take, it, it was less than two seconds. And her answer was rage. And this just astounded me because my mother was a very reticent um, woman when she got older and just, you know, class act, never an expletive out of her mouth. And for her to say the one word to describe that time was rage, I couldn't believe it, you know. And then I knew I had something and I said, put Susan back on the phone, my sister. And so she did. And I said to Susan, I need mother to come and live with me for a little while. I've got to get to the bottom of this. And so little did we know, it took two years. She lived with me for two years. And in the afternoons, I would interview her about the war. So that's the background of it. That's how you got started. Yeah. So, so why don't you, why don't you tell us, I mean, you know, a lot of the shows we've done, a lot of the books we've had, a lot of our viewers, they're familiar with the war and they know they have a general sense of how somebody joins the army or the air forces or the Navy or becomes a Marine. Um, I think there's probably a lot fewer people that know uh, what was the process of, of becoming an army nurse. So maybe just start there. How, uh, where is she coming from and, and what, makes her decide, hey, this is what I want to do. And then how does she actually become an army nurse? She um, she knew, and in chapter one, I describe it. She came from a very patriotic family, like most people were back then mm -hmm. and in America. And she was uh, reared in St. Paul, Minnesota. Her father had been a PFC in the First World War. On Pearl Harbor Day, she knew somehow she was going to serve, but she had no idea. Just like a lot of your viewers may not know the process. She had no idea how you do that, especially as a female. But she promised herself she'd figure that out. She was finishing up nursing school. She was in a practicum called um, for um, a private hospital that no longer exists called Miller Hospital. And she uh, thought, well, I've got to get through Miller. I've got to finish. I've got to graduate the following May. Then I've got to, I need a little experience. And if the war is still going on, by God, I'm joining. I just don't know how. So she didn't know the process either. She'd never heard of um, ANC, Army Nurse Corps, any of that. But what happened was in the um, spring following the year that she graduated from University of Minnesota, she, um, there were flyers that got sent around to all of the wards of every hospital, probably in the country, hers including, and she saw these flyers in which they were asking uh, the nurses uh, who were working in those hospitals to um, start training younger nurses who were graduating so that they could go take care of the soldiers overseas. And that really lit a fire under her because she'd promised herself secretly that she was going to join. And here there were young nurses that had less experience than she did. And she was going to be asked to train them. And that just really bothered her. And she thought, I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to figure out how to join because that's that's ridiculous. So she she um, she had heard that uh, you could join through Fort Snelling, and that you would be a part of uh, the Army Nurse Corps. And she talked one of her best friends into going with her, thinking that uh, her parents, because she was going to do it behind their backs, would not be as <laughs> upset if there was a friend of hers who would go with her to Fort Snelling and sign up. And the reason that she felt that she just could not do it, it, you know, that she had to do it clandestinely was because 
she kept overhearing her parents ever since the war started. Oh, thank God we have three girls. Thank God, because everybody, you know, all their mm, friends sure. had boys who were either conscripted or who had signed up. And so she was she was thought, oh my God, they'll they'll kill me. They they won't let me do it. And so she felt like she had to do it um, behind their backs. And so she and Lorraine Matsky, who was one of her dear friends, decided they would meet and uh, join mm. uh, Fort Snelling together one afternoon in February of uh, 1943. And that's what they did. So they caught the streetcar and then the bus and made it over to Fort Snelling <laughs> and joined how, up. How, how old was she? Let's see, uh, she was 22 and a half. So, so when you started reading the letters in the diary and interviewing your mom, what surprised you about the 22 and a half year old woman who who you're meeting, I mean, you, you were born, she was in her 40s when you were born. That's right. You yeah. would have known her, you know, as you became a teenager in her 50s. What surprised you about this young woman that you're meeting? Uh, the spunk. The It was all, you know, every once in a while, I'd see a glimpse of the spunk. You know, I, she was 60 when I was 17 or 18, you know. Um, but back then she just did not, she was, that was one of the reasons that she felt like her parents would be very upset because she was uh, full of caprice <laughs> and her impulsivity would really scared them for, for many things that she had done in her young life. And so um, she just didn't, she, it, it was a combination of this will be an adventure uh, along with her patriotism and her beguiling ways to manipulate, to, to get to go do this, uh, that were, that she just didn't have a lot of that left, you know, by the time I knew her, uh, whereas my older siblings, you know, had a younger mother that they saw more of that, you know? Uh, so I would say that was the big difference, but that sense of serving country over everything else. I was raised with that too. <laughs> you know, I mean, my, my, my parents pretty much, it was, it was exactly the same for, for me. And um, so I understood that side of it, but I, I did not know how beguiling and um, determined she really was until I saw through her eyes at 22. Well, you know, one of the things that I, I found really interesting and also very moving um, was the, the relationship between her and her dad, uh, because, yeah. you know, one of the things that I again that struck me was her dad had been in World War One. He knew what this was all about. So, I mean, were there discussions that they had either before as she's going in or a after she gets out, because obviously they can share things that she's not going to share with anything, anybody else. Right. Yeah. So maybe, you know, talk yeah. about that relationship a bit. Yeah. She was quite close to him. Um, I, uh, I think that it was something that she carried all the way to the end of her life. One day when I was just to kind of help people understand, uh, the level of, of love that those two had for each other. Um, I remember so vividly when I asked mother to tell me in my kitchen in San Antonio about going to Fort Snelling. She happened to just feel something in her peripheral vision. It was just this image that she kind of had and she turned and looked as she was on the streetcar and it was her father making his daily uh, walk on the streets of St. Paul headed toward the train depot in which he uh, managed all the food services for the St. Paul Union train depot at the time. And, you know, he walked with such a beautiful gait. He always had on a beautiful tweed suit. Uh, never met a stranger, walked with such felicity and joy for every uh, day. 
and there she was betraying him and and going off um and when she started telling me that oh it was just as if she was right back there and her mm. hands started shaking she looked down uh to the floor she you could just see she was still wearing all of that guilt for that mm. because what she had put her parents through and i think a lot of it was because she got so close to her father because she almost died when she was uh, 13 years old from tuberculosis. Right. And that changed her. In fact, it was, kind of, it was fate because during that year, she begged them not to send her to what they called thanatoriums, um, to one of the TV, because she called, they, she was an avid newspaper reader and, uh, you know, they called them death halls or something. Uh, and she said, please don't send me there to die, you know, when they first diagnosed her TB. And she worked it out with her parents and her grandmother, her paternal grandmother, for her grandmother, who was an LPN, to come and live with Mary in her room, sequestered for an entire year and nurse mm. Mary back to health, health. And during that year, her grandmother uh, was German, she read all of the great classics of children's literature to Mary in German. And at first, Mary was so weak that she had to write on a, a little chalkboard that her father got her what she would want. And before they knew it, she was writing in German what she would want, you know, for them to bring her from the kitchen. And that grandmother, her father's mother, nursing her back to health, teaching her German, during those that during those months that she was so sick she got a new lease on life when uh she was about to turn 14. she attributed it all to her grandmother uh her father's mother and um she learned german and little did she know that 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 she, she came out of that in her convalescence and said i'm going to be a nurse when i grow up and of course she ended up with the 39th because she was a good nurse and because she could speak fluent German. Yeah. So, so uh, it's really interesting. And I just, sir, I just a few weeks ago interviewed a cousin who is uh, now 76 years old. And um, he told me another reason that Mary was so, so close to her father was because her mother suffered from severe depression and wasn't really very involved with the girls' lives. Mm. And I just found that out. Amazing what you find when you start to dig, right? Yeah. Um, we have a question from a viewer that I think is worth putting up here who says, uh, general nursing is a world away from being a combat nurse. How did the army prepare young women to deal with the incredible wounds of war and the endless stream of wounded and dead. So maybe you could talk a little bit in a broad way about her her training and 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 did it did it do a good job of preparing her or was it you know you know kind of quite a shock when they arrived in Europe? Oh, that that is such a great question. Um, I don't know how many people know this, but. Um, when they they were sent after Fort Leonard Wood, my, my mother and Lorraine uh, started their army service uh, training in Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. And after three months, voila, they were swept off to Middle Tennessee for maneuvers training. And they were there for 10 months. My mother told me that her, that the chief nurse told them that the reason, of course, they complained, you know, no end with the misery of living on the ground in Middle Tennessee in the hot summer. And then, you know, as it got cold in the winter and they were still there on the ground in tents and uh, they did maneuvers training. They had a red team and a blue team and, and all of the whole uh, gamut. And they, but they did really have six soldiers uh, wounded uh, from friendly fire, all that kind of stuff that were coming in um, and she said that the chief nurse told them that General Patton, of course, wasn't in charge of Third Army yet, 
but that but everybody knew about him and she said that general Patton's grandmother was from that area and when he was growing up the topography of middle tennessee was similar to normandy's topography and he was the one or one of the ones at least who suggested that maneuvers be in middle tennessee and at first they were told they were going to be there you know through the summer and next thing they know they don't they don't get out of there until december <laughs> or january so it was a long time that they were there and as much as they complained they all contracted dysentery it was miserable uh everybody in mother's tent had dysentery twice uh, they they went through the gamut they had everything and boy she said it was just the most horrible thing and then the next year boom she said normandy and she thanked god they went through maneuvers because she would have been so you know we wouldn't have had the preparation for it mm. well i mean and, and and you know um one of the things you point out in the book is that the especially these evacuation hospitals they're they're supposed to be as close to the front as, as they can be yes. um so she's uh she's under fire pretty quickly in normandy so maybe talk a little bit about kind of her arrival in normandy and, and what's going on and what's happening to her in this hospital yeah when she first got there um the first evacs had been there for six weeks and her, the 39th, as well as uh, some of the other evacs came for the second wave uh, in mid-July of 1944. And they were to relieve the evacs that had been there for six weeks. One of the first things that she saw, which just, just shocked her, was because no matter how much you go through maneuvers, you don't see dead paratroopers in trees. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when the first evacs came through, they were so inundated with patients, there was no way they had time to pull those dead paratroopers from the trees. So it wasn't until that second um, wave of, of evacs came along that were able to do some of that work. And there was a little bit of a reprieve there. They were mainly trying to just give the first wave of evacs a break and let them, you know, go back and recuperate. And a lot of the very first patients that she, that they received were German uh, that they captured there who were uh, injured or, or really sick. And so from the get go, she was put in, um, you know, sometimes with with uh, Germans, if they could separate them, sometimes they couldn't. And sometimes they were in the same tents as um, the allied soldiers. But she said that, um, you know, it was really shocking at first, but then they just all, and I'm sure, I don't know where they learned this, but they all, uh, in order to get through each night of the strafing and the bombing and the, you know, <laughs> you know, that one time they, one of the evacs prior to their coming, you know, they walked out the tent and half a body was, or a leg was sitting there in, in front of their tent, you know. Um, she said that what they would tell themselves is, oh, it's 4th of July again. We're just celebrating, you know, every time they would, they, mm -hmm. that's just the way they, they would cope with it. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's just, it's just indescribable that, you know, somebody that was so sheltered her whole life. And then, you know, no matter how much maneuvers taught in terms of how to care for those patients, uh, and the topography and putting up with the mosquitoes and the bugs and the, you know, all that, um, very bad conditions for living and dysentery and what have you to have more on right on top of you was, um, uh, you know, I guess she, to me, she acclimated very quickly. If you just look at those letters. You know, within the third or fourth letter, boy, she was just, oh, it's 4th of July again tonight, you know. Uh, yeah. But I also, but I also thought it was interesting that several of the letters she's directed to her dad and he said, oh, exactly. and she says, don't tell mom or only tell mom if you think it's okay. That's right. right. That's right. Yeah. Absolutely. Y your, your mother was quite a writer. 
Uh, I, I'm sure that struck you. I, I, there's a passage here that, that it's kind of long, but I wanted to read it and, and kind of get your response to it. And it's a letter to her mother. She sent on December 18th, 1944. Last night, the rush started at 9 p.m. and we never sat down once except for the chow. The wounded were the wounds were terrible and the poor boys were scared um, and wet and cold. One little 19 year old boy received a back wound and had to lie on his stomach. And when I went to give him a hypo, his nose was just dripping and he couldn't use his hands because they were wrapped in gauze and strapped along his side. So I got some dressing to use for hankies and just had him blow his nose until it was all clean. Remember how you used to say, now blow, mom? Well, I felt like a mother then. He said, gee, nurse, thanks a lot. And there were tears flowing down his face. And I hate myself for griping about my own little troubles and feel so ashamed when I see our boys come in like that night after night. Well, like the captain said last night, it is up to our generation to make the supreme sacrifice, and we can only hope that it will be a sacrifice great enough so that our children won't have to do it 20 years from now. If there is enough left of our generation to have children, I mean the kind that will make good American citizens because we all know the cream of the crop is being destroyed in this war. She, she definitely... There's a progression in her letters, which you, you see the maturation, from. right? Liberally, yeah, and it's getting darker and darker as you go through the war. Yes. Yeah. And, and and so what? I mean, one of the other things that I think is interesting is she's interacting uh, with a lot of civilians and a part of the world that's been absolutely kind of devastated. Obviously, what were her impressions of? the French and the Belgians and the Germans and the civilians that she was interacting with. <laughs> I hate to, uh, I hate, I hate to quote her too much on the French, but oh, I feel she said it's they like, always look real pretty on top, but we're dirty as hell underneath. <laughs> I mean, she says so funny things. You know, the thing that I think struck her the very most was just the absolute destruction of such a high-tech country it when she got yeah. into germany and she saw how advanced they were and how they chose you know because of tyranny to destroy themselves yeah. <laughs> and <clears throat> uh along with a lot of other people uh and it it just she could not get her mind around that. How? Why? Why would they do that? You know, when they stepped, when she stepped in that hospital that in post-war Germany, um, and it had, you know, electric doors and uh, three indoor swimming pools and just the most opulent, most, you know, things that we've never dreamed of having in a hospital to this day, you know and the the amount of destruction that she saw the she she talked a lot about the little children and um she was alarmed at the sexism like for example that she said that the men would always be if they did have a cart you know a, a way to go around on the horse and carriage or whatever the men would be up there but the women and children would be walking along you know the downtrodden women and children uh she thought that was really strange you know um and just the the choice uh for for tyranny over right. advancement really just boggled her mind yeah. and to allow their the children to be destroyed like that yeah. uh nancy there's a complicated romance embedded in this war story. Mm -hmm. And it, it's about your mom, so it, it feels awkward to even bring it up. But you brought it up because you put it in the book, so I feel like I can bring it up. Uh, she uh, falls in love uh, with Robbie, who's on the same ship with her coming across the ocean, uh, and they become engaged. But even as she's engaged to him, she becomes involved quite intensely with somebody that you will only name in the book as Dr. W, although I'm sure you know Dr. W's last name. Um, can you tell us more about this? And um, as the daughter of the protagonist in this book, how did 
this all strike you when you kind of uncovered it? Because I can't imagine you knew anything about it before you started working on it. I didn't. And it was the reason I, um, the mystery of the section of the service diary that she had torn out was because those months were spent with W, uh, the doctor captain that she had spent the war with. And that's why she had ripped out those pages. And I, I didn't get that out of her until almost two years were up of, of her living with me. But um, it was after my mother left, and I think I was in maybe the, the fourth iteration of this book before I dared to even show it to an agent. And when I finally, uh, I think it was my fifth iteration that I, that I showed to a couple agents and Peter Riva ended up becoming my agent. Um, and he invited me to um, come out to his uh, ranch in New Mexico to talk to him and his wife because they felt like this story needed to be told. They felt really uh, close to this project, but they wanted to teach me how to tell it um, because Peter said, I'm not getting the truth out of you. And I uh, didn't really know what he meant. And when I got out there after several days of coaxing me, he pulled out a lot of the truth of it. And I, it was something I just didn't want to talk about in my, uh, you know, I mainly out of protection for my siblings. Um, I didn't want to talk about it, but Peter helped me to understand that what was really going on was that Mary chose Robbie at the end because even though Robbie was also in the war, he wasn't in the same war. He didn't share the same experiences as she had with W. And she just could not look at W every day for the rest of her life without bringing all those war memories because they experienced the same war. And I think it's pretty good theory. She never said that, but I, I feel like Peter was probably right that uh, that made sense to me. And it also made sense because she didn't have anything to do with anybody from the war after the war. Well, I know you wrote that and I found that really fascinating. Like all these characters, these wonderful characters in your book, the nurses and doctors and orderlies and all these people. And she, she didn't have anything to do with any of them. Yeah, I think she just, she couldn't survive it unless she cut it all off. And did she ever address that? If you, uh, did you ever ask her about that when you were interviewing her about this book? She, um, I didn't ask her that specifically. It was just more of a, you know, um, she said something like, and I'd have to go back to my notes, but I think it was something like, you know, when you go through something like that, uh, you have to compartmentalize. And that's the way that I chose to compartmentalize. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of the answer I got from her. So um, so we've talked a little bit about Normandy and I, we don't have, you know, we want to keep an eye on the time, but just so folks know, what's sort of the, the arc of, of, of the progress of the 39th? I mean, we, we talk about her, uh, serving with third army. So what is the 39th up to? Where are they at? You know, what sort of things or campaigns were they involved in? They go through all of Normandy and then, um, they're holed up in the Heinrich Himmler barracks, uh, beginning out in, um, November. They're holed up there until I think, uh, once battle of the bulge is over, which is what the, by the second week, where's January, the Heinrich Himmler uh, barracks. It's right um, on the, it's, it's right, it's like 12 kilometers um, south of Bastogne. Okay. So they're still in France, but barely. And uh, she's, uh, that, the, in terms of the arc of the story, 
you know, getting those patients out of Bastogne and then the flood of them into the 39th. And I don't think there, from my, I can't remember offhand, but I think it was only two other, maybe two other evacs from Third Army that were that close to it. So, you know, oh my God, you know, just did the hunt in the hundreds of admissions per night. Uh, and then, um, she said something, um, and then they go through Belgium, Luxembourg, and then on into post-war Germany afterwards in the spring of 45. She is kept in Germany all through the summer because she could speak German and because she didn't have very many AR points. In other words, she could, <laughs> she wasn't a very good soldier. She was a great nurse and a terrible soldier, and she didn't toe the line very well. And so her AR points were um, not so good, and she ended up having to stay, and, and she figured she was going on to the CBI too um, until uh, uh, we dropped the atom bomb. So she felt for sure she would never get to go home uh, as a, any kind of leave prior to going to CBI. In fact, they, uh, I think just very soon uh, after D, after uh, VE Day, they made her watch a film on to Tokyo. <laughs> and she's like, uh-oh, you know, and some of her friends were already, you know, planning to go on home. But I, I think it was also because she could, um, you know, she she could help take care of those Germans that were in those uh, in post-war hospitals. So I think that was a lot of the reason that she was one of the last ones uh, to leave Europe on October 31st of 45. She goes through some pretty intense experiences that you detail in the book. And, you know, probably the closest connection that most of us have to an Army field hospital is a certain TV show from the uh, yeah. 70s or 80s, the uh, MASH yeah. uh, TV show, of course, which is involved in the Korean War. Uh, but I'm sure you've seen episodes of MASH. I'm sure that must have come to mind when you were working on this book. How, how would you compare them? Um, or what, what do you feel like you learned that, that we didn't learn <laughs> watching MASH? However you want to address that. I mean, I, I was so young when, when MASH was around, but um, I do, I did have images of it just because of the way when I would do my research and the way she described things, it was, uh, you know, what I thought of more, more than MASH though, uh, was some scenes from Band of Brothers uh, because they show uh, some of the, it seemed the only thing that I felt like in, in both MASH and Band of Brothers was something um, startling that I asked her specifically about when she talked about the way the, 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 the boys would show up um, when, they were so, when they'd been so battle-worn, whether they were sick uh, with malaria, pneumonia, what have you, or if they were injured. Um, their hair was always long mm -hmm. and matted and full of lice. And, you know, in all of those shows, they always depict them with the crew cuts. And, <laughs> and she said, oh, no, I mean, think about it. They didn't have time for any grooming of the, they couldn't do any of that stuff. They were, you know, they were just trying to survive the minute. They, they're, they're, everything was a mess. You know, they, were just dying to get de-liced and, and get their hair cut off and their beards cut off and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, the way that they appear in those shows versus the way they really were after after going through, you know, uh, one horrific uh, altercation after the next, it was just really, really different, you know. Mm -hmm. And I'd, I'd never thought about that. Well, one of the things that really surprised me is you, you – you talk or well, she talks about it and you talk about it too um but there's a an instance of her actually working with uh some german medics and german surgeons that are oh, in the man. hospital um so i mean first of all you know, obviously tell us a little bit about how that all comes about and and do we know what she thought about this because of course as she's advancing into germany she's seeing some a lot more of what the germans have gotten up to and that has to have of rage. Yeah, rage, right? Rage. So yeah. how is she how is this 
relationship sort of working? You know, I think part of the reason that we decided for the boys would be the right title was because of her um, her response to those ward boys. They captured this uh, uh, surgeon, this German uh, surgeon, and four, I think, four ward boys at one time. Two of those ward boys were assigned to Mary because she could talk to them. And um, she said the surgeon just had impeccable skills and was wonderful. I mean, the other surgeons, the allied surgeons loved working with him. And one day she was talking to uh, one of the two German ward boys. And this was early on. This was like end of July, uh, early August of uh, 44 in Normandy. And she told the saddest story about this kid was 17. He was on his way home from school and the Gestapo stopped him and his friends and said, get in the Jeep. And they didn't even get to go home to tell their parents that they were going to war. And this kid said to this day, I don't know, my parents probably think I'm dead. I've been, I've had no way to contact them to tell them you know, they figured out, I'm sure, that he got, he never even got to go home from school to, from school that day. And, um, you know, she just was filled with compassion for, for that kind of thing. But then as she kept, you see this dark side of her coming out, especially after Bastogne. And the, and then as she, they go through and they get into more and more war-torn territory. And ugh, she just is so conflicted. She's so conflicted because as it, on an individual level, she treats them one boy. It's just another boy. It's just another, it's just another young man. And yet as a whole, you know, hatred, absolute hatred. Now, it's really fascinating. And she said that one time that the, um, well, not one time, but many times, the German soldiers were so terrified during, uh, you know, when they would have them in the hospital, uh, in these wards, in the in the tents, that they would cry out, Svester, you know, meaning sister, which was, I guess, because they probably had Catholic nuns as nurses growing up. And they were terrified that, you know, uh, one of the one of the guys or uh, from the 39th or perhaps another soldier from allied forces would slit their throats during the night, you know, as they lay in, uh, on the cot. So um, she felt so sad that that they didn't feel safe. But then as it kept going on and she saw the destruction, she would just be enraged as a as a whole thinking of them. But on an individual basis. She was all about caring for them. It's very conflicted feelings. There's there's a lot of very um, intense personal stories and moments in, in the book, and and one that just really leaped out at me that I'll ask you to tell us about involves uh, when they were very low on blood, and oh, yeah. uh, and somebody somebody who she had treated before came back into the uh, into the ward. Can you tell us that story? Yeah, there was a private that she had been what they called specialed, and I'd never heard that term, but they they had, uh, sometimes they would assign a nurse for, for a kid that was just really, really sick. And the nurse would be only assigned that person, that patient to take care of. And back in the summer, um, he had been specialed to this private. And uh, she called him Redmond, although I don't know if that was really his name, but that's what she recollected his name was. There was no way for me to find out. Um, so we called him, so she called him Private Redman. And he was a, a, in a tank unit, but he was in the hospital for pneumonia. And by the time he convalesced from pneumonia, from the, from pneumonia they couldn't find his tank unit. And so then for the next couple of months, he became another ward boy and just had to tag along, which I didn't know they did that, but they, they would do that. They would just tag along with whoever rescued them and, and uh, cared for them until they could find their unit again. 
And lo and behold, he shows back up with 40% burns on his body and a gunshot wound to the chest. Um, when, um, you know, out of, out of that whole battle of the bulge and because he had been returned to the tank unit in October of that year. And so their own supply room had been bombed, shelled. And so there was nothing left. They didn't think for plasma and this kid needs plasma or he's going to die. And she was so close to that kid and she was determined to find plasma for him. And it ended up that the only plasma they could find had colored written on the labels. And so she ripped off the colored labels. Meaning it was, it was only to be used for uh, African-American soldiers. Correct. Which she thought was just so absurd, you know, and she ripped off the labels and, they used that for him and for other soldiers. That's right. And she, you know, later I started thinking about that so much. And I just, you know, to borrow a term from JFK, it was moral courage to me because she was defying an army rule. I mean, blatant army rule. Uh, and, and she, she chose yeah, I mean, I, I just think that was so morally courageous. Uh, and she had no idea if she, and, and she knew, you know, oh my God, they, they could, you know, they could send me back home for this. Well, but she's, I don't called, care. She, she's called into, somebody reports this, right? And she's mm -hmm. called in to Chief Max and to, to her superior officer to explain this. And she, kind of, who's, a, who's a hard ass, <laughs> who's been hard, hard on ass. her for the last year and a half. <laughs> But then she commends her for it, which was just amazing. Yeah. So moral courage. <laughs> I think they all had it. Um, yeah, no, I was going to, uh, I, I mean, it's not really my turn, but I do have a question. Uh, so um, uh, uh, your mother uh, didn't stay in touch with any of these people. So I was wondering if, if you made an attempt to track any of them down and part and parcel with that is a question that some that came up with that somebody asked which was have you been able to go to europe uh and sort of trace some I of your mother's to. footsteps i've been to europe, europe several times but i haven't been to europe since i did this project and it is my dream to go and trace exactly where the 39 I think chris did. anderson would be a great tour guide for you uh, yeah. um but did have you did you try were you in did you try to find mona or dr w or any of those people or did you just say nope leaving that stone unturned <laughs> i i really did not the only person i knew was lorraine because mary had a relationship with L lorraine prior to the war and therefore she kept up with lorraine and when I was 16 years old, we went to visit Lorraine in Tacoma, Washington. And Lorraine sat me down when I was 16 and told me a lot of war stories about mother that mother had never told me. And uh, little did I know that one day, <laughs> those, those, what she told me would come in very handy. You'd be trying to remember those stories right. 40 years later. So, so Nancy, what, I mean, the other thing I'd like to just touch on briefly, because again, it's not something that's really addressed um, and certainly not sufficiently in the case of, of women who serve. Um, but talk to me, talk to us a little bit about what happens when she comes home and, and mm. what this is. This is not the homecoming you expect, right? Right. Um, I did not know. I didn't think <laughs> honestly, bless you. I did not think honestly to talk with mother about that time. She had already gone back up to Richmond um, when my Aunt Nancy, who died last fall at age 100, mother lived to 99 and a half and her sister Nancy lived to 100, mm. a little over 100. Aunt Nancy was still very mentally sharp um, about six years ago now. 
and I interviewed her over the phone. And she told me that my mother went to her room and she did not come out for months. And they did not know what to do with her. She was going to be married. She wouldn't have anything to do with it. She didn't talk. They would leave her food at the door. Um, Aunt Nancy said it was just horrible. I mean, the, they, didn't, they didn't know what to do. What, was she going to even show up for her own wedding that was going to be in February? And she literally, uh, Aunt Nancy said, came out of her room twice. Once because Inga, her mother, decided, um, okay, we've got to do something. And so she decided they should, she should host a reunion of some of the people who had uh, been in uh, nurses overseas, not necessarily in the 39th, of course, but just nurses that had come from, that they knew from St. Paul who had also served. And she hosted them to come. And Mary was forced to come downstairs and, <laughs> and see those girls that she'd grown up with. And then the other time was when she met W um, to talk to, to end the relationship. And that was it. So, uh, you know, she had to, she had to process what she'd been through there. And there was no way to do it unless she just sequestered herself in that room for months. Did you see any signs no. growing up of her PTSD? I did. When you read that passage about the Kleenex and the and the young man and she was in every list. I mean, I, I don't think I could find a list in those letters in which she did not write Kleenex. Please, mother, send Kleenex tissues. She was obsessed over them. We used to make teaser about them. Mother, if you'd only had stock in Kleenex tissues, because she was like that the entire time we were growing up. <clears throat> and she had to have them in every room. And when we would make her bed, hers and daddy's bed as it's teenagers, I'd find wadded up Kleenex tissues all underneath her pillow and down underneath the bed in her robe. You know, she obviously had been crying a lot. Uh, and, and she had tissues with her all the time. It was just a very strange obsession, and it, I didn't understand it until I started reading those letters. And then the other thing that I just, a lot of people say, oh, everybody does that when they get older. They get cold. They're very cold. She was terrified of getting cold. And when I would, I would, um, and when she was in San Antonio from those two years, you know, she was in her 90s. And <clears throat> I uh, was at the time married to a geriatrician, a, a, a physician um, that specialized in geriatrics. And he was terrified that she would fall because that's the usually the end of, 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 you know, someone of that advanced age, you know, falling is a big reason that they end up dying later. So he said, just get in the shower with her and you know shower her and i would do that but i would have to get it just very very steamy hot in that room and show her how how warm i'd gotten the room the bathroom before she would go in there and one day as i helped her get undressed to get her into the shower she said you know i know you think i'm crazy about this and and how i ha you have to prove to me that the shower is really warm but Nancy Carroll, I was so bone cold for two straight years. I never could get warm. And I just can't go through that feeling again. So it definitely was still there. Well, Nancy, I, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. I, I, I just, I've been hanging on your every word. You sent all these pictures. <laughs> And I oh never, yeah, I never put any of them up. That's but here's okay. a here's a picture of your mom, uh, yeah. uh, Mary, as a, as a nurse in the war. And just to be uh, fair, this is Robbie, who she met and who she married, and who was your dad is your yep. dad. And uh, so uh, we at least gotta mention those two pictures. And I want to mention again, uh, your book is called For the Boys: uh, The True Account of a Combat Nurse in Patton's 
third army. So thank you. It's been a, a great oh, hour. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you both so thank much for your you. support. Really appreciate Good it. Good luck with it. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Wow. I need a moment for that. But Chris, next week, we have yeah. a long-awaited milestone yes. in history, happy hour, history. It could be history, <laughs> happy hour, history. Yes. As we approach our fourth anniversary, do you know what that milestone is? I think somebody's about to be like, like capped, as we say here. Well, there, there, we have someone who's going to be our first five-time guest. Yeah, so he's capped. So he's he gets a cap. Yes, yeah. we're bringing back Joe Balkowski to talk about the 29th Division in World War II, um, and talk about the fourth book in his five-book series, Tortured Souls, and so. We're very excited. There will be a ceremony to mark this, <laughs> and uh, we'll we'll pay homage to Joe, and we'll have a chance to talk to him. And I think he's uh, not only one of our favorites, but a favorite of everybody else as well. Absolutely. So yeah. I think people will be glad to see Joe Belkowski back here. I was just looking at Facebook at uh, four four guides in Normandy who completed a hike from Omaha Beach to Saint Lo over two days, following in the I think it was the 115th Regiment in the uh, in the 29th Division. Yeah. If I have Absolutely. those numbers right. So um, Mike Vander Dobelstein and three other people. Uh, so I've been following their hike yeah. and uh, and then next week and I saw Joe Belkowski was following their hike and then next wow. week he'll be he'll be with us. See? There you go. Very exciting. Yeah. So please, guys, subscribe to us on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook. Shout at us on Twitter. Listen to our podcast. Back us on Patreon and browse historyhappyhour.com. Thanks, everybody. Be safe.